Counterterrorism was the issue discussed at a forum held in Florida on Monday. Among those speaking at the event, Attorney General John Ashcroft and FBI Director Robert Mueller. The forum was organized by Senator Bob Graham, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and his counterpart, Porter Goss, who heads the Intelligence Committee in the House. It's just under two hours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tim Moore, the Mr. of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. It's my pleasure to introduce a, a key part of our effort here in Florida uh, on Florida's team to strengthen domestic security in our state, uh, our Lieutenant Governor, Frank Brogan, for remarks. Governor Brogan. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, thank you, Commissioner Moore. I need to spend just a moment thanking Commissioner uh, Moore for his efforts and that of all of the wonderful people across the state of Florida who have pulled together so very well in the wake of 9-11. And Commissioner Moore has headed up our effort in the state of Florida, making certain that we not only coordinate our effort within the Sunshine State, but also seeing to it that we coordinate our effort with local, state, and federal officials. And he's done an incredible job in helping, we believe, the state of Florida forge what is being seen as a model for the rest of the nation by way of homeland security. So thank you very much, Commissioner Moore, for your leadership in that regard. Mayor Hood, thank you for uh, hosting us in uh, one of the most beautiful cities in America. And again, for your leadership on the issue of domestic security and homeland security here in the state of Florida. Mayor Hood has also demonstrated a keen awareness of the issues and has helped to lead the charge from a city and a local government perspective on a statewide scale, and we appreciate her leadership as well. To the Attorney General, we welcome you here to the Sunshine State this morning, Attorney General, and we thank you for your efforts uh, on a national and even international scale. Uh, I happen to be with the President of the United States on 9-11 in Sarasota, Florida at an elementary school and had the opportunity to stand next to the leader of the free world as he not only had the compassion for those that we had lost, were losing the wounded and the families of those who were touched by that horrific tragedy, but I also watched on that particular day unfold the beginning of the coalition building that would ultimately, we believe, one day uh, rid the world of international terrorism and better secure the 260 million Americans who call this the greatest country on the face of the earth. To our respective chairs, uh, Senator Graham and uh, Congressman Goss, thank you for your leadership in Washington every day on the issue of homeland security as you both work with your incredibly important committees to make certain that we do articulate what we believe is one of the most important initiatives uh, maybe in the history of the country, helping to better secure the security of all Americans, and you are helping to lead that charge, and we appreciate your leadership in that regard. To all of you around this table and in this room, thank you as well very, very much for helping to, again, we believe, create a model for the nation. Uh, many times I hear from my colleagues around the country that Florida is looked to on many issues, but especially on this issue, and especially in the wake of 9-11, as the state to look to for how to articulate and communicate local, state, and federal initiatives to better securitize the, uh, the domestic security that has become such an important part of everything that we do and everything that we are here in the Sunshine State. So this morning I bring you greetings from Governor Bush. Welcome to our out-of-state friends who are with us this morning to Central Florida and the Sunshine State. And thank you for helping to coordinate this massive effort that we believe is raising the comfort level of all Floridians and even all people in America. That indeed not only are we more secure than ever before, but indeed, we're going to see the day and time when we do rid the world of international terrorism and see a day and time where people's security continues to be the number one initiative on the lips, minds, and hearts of policy makers and policy setters all over the United States of America. Thank you for your efforts in that regard. And with that, I would like to no doubt reintroduce to you, because he needs no introduction in this room, uh, he uh, is indeed the chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the United States Senate. He he is helping to coordinate and articulate that very important cooperative effort of which I spoke. And I bring to the podium now United States Senator Bob Graham. Senator.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. And thanks to each of you, particularly to uh, Commissioner Moore, who has uh, been the producer of this uh, dialogue today, and uh, Mayor Hood, our hostess uh, for this dialogue, and to each of you. I think if you will look around the uh, room, and we've just been joined by the Deputy Director of the CIA, uh, we have an unprecedented group of people from the international, the federal, state and local level, all of whom have a common interest, and that is protecting Floridians and Americans against a repetition of what happened on September the 11th. Uh, I am very pleased to be joined in co-hosting this conference with my good friend and colleague, uh, Congressman Porter Goss, who is the chairman of the Permanent uh, House Committee on Intelligence. Uh, Congressman Goss and I's hope is that this conference will be the beginning, and I underscore the word beginning, of a long and productive dialogue among all of us who have some part of the responsibility for protecting Americans against further terrorist attacks, and that together we will make a contribution to securing the safety of our families and our nation. Uh, there is no person who has a greater role in that than our keynote speaker this morning, the distinguished Attorney General of the United States, uh, Mr. John uh, Ashcroft. Uh, General Ashcroft is America's chief law enforcement officer. As his title suggests, he is the general in the war on terrorism. First of all, Bob, thank you. Senator Graham, it's nice to be with you. And I thank you for your service to the United States of America in a most important and critical of responsibilities, that of helping us have the right kind of intelligence community and the right kind of integrity in that community. And Porter, it doesn't happen by accident. It's, it, it is uh, uh, almost an anomaly of history that one state would be the home of the leaders in both houses of the United States Congress in intelligence. I'm certain that not all intelligence is located in Florida, but a good bit of it is with uh, you all, and I, I want to thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the director of the FBI is here. I want to thank Bob Mueller for his outstanding service to the United States of America. He is... Uh, I'm sure that most of you law enforcement professionals were warned when you came into, jo into your office, be prepared, something very substantial could happen. It happens when anybody takes a major office, and the key is to be ready early. I believe it was in Bob's first week that uh, this uh, whole uh, situation started to unfold on September the 11th, and I thank him for his outstanding commitment and service. I, uh, I could go down the list of those of you that have greeted me here today, those of you from across America. I saw friends here from Oregon, so it's from sea to shining sea. Let me make a few important comments as my contribution to this meeting. Terrorism, as we have seen it, and as we are learning about it, is driving a necessary integration of law enforcement, not only across the nation, but around the world. It has been said that necessity is the mother of invention. In this circumstance, I believe it is fair to say that necessity is the mother of cooperation. May I describe for you my understanding of how the terrorist threat is currently arrayed, how we see it, and why it mandates a kind of cooperation and integration in our efforts. First, let me just say that during my years as Attorney General of my home state of Missouri, and I spent eight years in that setting, I was accustomed to what I would now refer to as more or less garden variety crime. The perpetra perpetrators of a typical criminal act would be individuals who lived in the community, who planned the crime in the community, who executed the crime in the community, who stayed in the community, and were apprehended in the community, tried in the community, eventually sentenced and served time as a result of their nefarious activities. That's not the model for the international terrorism 
which we now have the responsibility of addressing. If you look carefully, you'll see that the terrorist has fragmented the various aspects of the acts of terrorism so that the training takes place in one setting. Uh, planning may take place in another setting. In a third or fourth country, subsequent meetings to update the terrorists on fine-tuning the operation. The staging may take place in another setting, perhaps even Florida, and the execution in another setting. Now, as you see the unfolding of these terrorist acts, you see that the fact that they move from Afghanistan to Europe, perhaps to Southeast Asia, to the United States of America in the perpetration of the act. You see this fragmentation, which means at least two things. First, the interval for discovery and interruption in any one location is small because the entirety of the planning and staging and, and development of the plans and the financing doesn't place in one, take place in one area. <clears throat> the fact is that any one group of law enforcement officials might not see enough of the operation to understand what's going on. So that the training camp is in one area and doesn't appear to be all that much of a threat perhaps, or at least isn't understood or even if it is understood, it is acquiesced in in that setting. The financial arrangements are made in another location. The planning takes place in another location. And finally, the act takes place. And this fragmentation means that the intervals for discovery means that the opportunity to see and understand and detect in advance the, the potential of prevention is very, very difficult. Similarly, if the responsibility of a culture after an act has taken place is to punish the act, the evidentiary trail for the prosecutor is not something that's in the community like it normally is in a garden variety criminal act that we've talked about. The evidentiary trail is a trail which goes around the world. And I simply mention this to indicate that we have to have a great deal of capacity to communicate and to coordinate our actions if we are to unify the evidentiary trail necessary for prosecution and the information that's necessary for prevention. Let me just say that prevention has to be the highest priority. When the perpetrator of a crime seeks to extinguish himself or herself in the commission of a crime, the idea of prosecution is some, it's substantially impaired as a, as a disincentive for the commission of the crime. And so we have to make sure that we do everything we can to prevent. The best friend of prevention in the arena of terrorism is information. And information is what we're talking about here at this particular time. So necessity, the need to detect and prevent, the need to prosecute, to integrate the evidence and to present it, 
These necessities drive us toward coordination. Lateral coordination from the United States to other nations. So like never before, it's a responsibility of our government to work well with other governments, to, to get the right information, to share the information. And vertical cooperation and integration in order to make sure that those of you that really do the work of public safety are involved in the process and can assist us. And that you can understand when you're encountering information what information is important in the setting of prevention for international terrorism. So if fragmentation is the condition or the description of the way international terrorism takes place, integration must be the description of the way we operate as law enforcement officials. We must integrate our efforts nationally with those of you locally, and we must integrate in a substantial way those efforts that we make nationally in an international setting. Now, the world understands, and I believe we in America know as well what President Bush now has been teaching us, that we're in this for the long haul, that this is an important responsibility. This is not episodic. This is not a single event. It's unlikely that tens of thousands of individuals were trained in camps so that they could pull off one or two days of terrorism with a couple dozen people. And uh, we have to make a commitment to do things, not just to say things. Abraham Lincoln said, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Let ours be more than just a time of saying. Let ours be a time of doing things to curtail terrorism. And what we want to do, at least at the federal level, is to promote this sense of integration. That's why convening this meeting uh, is so important because it builds this capacity for us to integrate our effort so that our integration and cooperation can fight this concept of fragmentation, which is the characteristic of international terrorism. Now, one of the things we've been doing is immediately upon this event, we convened what were called anti-terrorism task forces. They've been working for five months now. We've tried to do that to make sure that our U.S. attorneys are talking and working with local law enforcement officials at every juncture. I've been meeting with the anti-terrorism task forces in my travels, and I believe we're making progress, and they are important. They are also uh, uh, mirrored by, or they mirror the work in many cases of the joint terrorism task forces that are under the auspices of the FBI. Training, we need to make sure that those of you that we will rely on are equipped with the right skills. We need to recognize that uh, in order to make intelligence sharing meaningful, training is essential. And both the Department of Justice and the FBI are providing counterterrorism education conferences, which provide specific training on intelligence for state and local officials. And very frankly, I don't see this just as the federal government wanting to train you about how you can use intelligence we gather. Very frankly, I see this as an opportunity for you to develop an understanding about how you can be eyes and ears that will be very helpful to us. I think in many circumstances you may encounter information uh, and those who work with you can encounter information that could, could be very valuable to protecting the security of the United States of America. The FBI will lead a national policy summit with state and local officials on sharing intelligence very shortly. The FBI is updating its existing state and local anti-terrorism training called SLAT to include intelligence training so that we now understand this responsibility. Uh, they'll be conducting about six SLAT seminars throughout the country this year. They've already uh, trained uh, about 950 people in several of these seminars. 
and this training is going to be available on CD-ROM. Uh, January 7th through the 11th, 250 state and local partners were trained at the National Advocacy Center, and this is just the beginning of our work to develop this relationship, which will provide our integration and coordination in response to the fragmentation of this threat of international terrorism and the need to work together in order to make sure we curtail it. Uh, successful counterterrorism efforts require a legal ability to share critical information, and that means security clearances. And the Department of Justice and the FBI recognize security clearances are important, and we're working to expedite those. A thousand state and local officials have been identified by FBI field offices for security clearances. About 130 of those clearance applications are now underway. Let me just say one word before I conclude about security clearance. Security clearance is essential to getting information that you need to know. It's not a license to have all the information that there is to know. Because one of the fundamental components of an intelligence operation is compartmentalization. And things that I don't need to know, I simply don't want to know. Because if we really want our operation to be successful, we need to not only have people who understand that there are certain things they need to know, need to know well, and need to handle very carefully, but when they don't need to know it, they simply aren't there. And I frequently, when the National Security Council is meeting and I'm involved, and they start to talk about things, Mayor, that I'm not really a critical part of, I get up and leave the room uh, because it's an understanding that we all have to have that just the top secret clearance doesn't mean that it's good for me to be in possession of the information where I might make a mistake or otherwise compromise it. It's a need to know thing as well as a security uh, authorization. So we have this great opportunity of working together. It is an opportunity to do things that support and secure liberty that save the potentials for freedom that America is all about. Some would seek to characterize the situation as a balance somehow, that you're either going to have security or you're going to have freedom. I think that mischaracterizes the way in which we ought to look at the equation. Security or the securing is the securing of something. And what we are securing is freedom. We are securing opportunity. We are securing a way of life. We are securing a set of values. The terrorist does not believe in our values. The terrorist is threatened by our values. The terrorist doesn't believe in the marketplace of ideas and freedom at all. If he did, he'd expect the marketplace to embrace that which he offers. The terrorist simply says, I can't expect to win based on the merit of my position. I have to extort from individuals my position because they would never embrace it as free individuals. Theirs is a rejection of freedom, and what we seek to secure is freedom. And I can tell you this, that we have at the Justice Department made a clear instruction that we should think outside the box. We've got to be able to change our process, to recognize the fragmentation, to begin at accelerated and increased levels of coordination. We may think outside the box, but we may never think outside the Constitution. 